What's up YouTube? Today we are working on some Psydub. So this video is in collaboration with Pete Callard of Spongle fame. For those who don't know, uh, he actually has recently started his own channel, breaking down a couple of how he kind of does his guitar techniques and all sorts of stuff like that. I actually discovered his channel through a video he did on the guitar riff for Dorset Perception, which is actually one of my favorite Spongle tracks. So I contacted him to do a collaboration video and, and yeah, this is gonna be the result of our collaboration. So I'm gonna work on this project for the next couple of videos. I think in this video, I wanna deal with how I created the kind of bass sound, uh, a couple of other elements in the track. And I'm also gonna hand over to Pete to discuss the kind of guitar elements, which he added to the track. So for those who are into guitar type stuff or for those Spongle fans who are interested in how the kind of melody from Dorset Perception and some other things kind of came to be, you should definitely head over to his channel. I'm gonna post a link in the description as well as uh, a little link over here to that exact video. And he also is going to be giving away the guitar tabs and other kind of stuff from this project that we're gonna do on his Buy Me A Coffee page, which I think is kind of similar to Patreon. Um, but I'm gonna post a link to that in the description as well. So you should definitely go over there and support him if you are into guitar content and that kind of thing, or if you just enjoy this video and wanna support him as well. So anyway, let's dive into the project. <laughs> So first things first, I wanna show you guys how I created the baseline. So one thing to just bear in mind is this project is gonna develop over a bunch of videos. So this might not be the kind of final product, but this is just where we're sitting at the moment and kind of like my thoughts behind creating this kind of baseline and how it's different to the kind of regular baseline that I create like Cytron spaces and that kind of thing. So with this type of thing, I tried to take inspiration from like traditional dub music. So like that kind of reggae bass lines, a lot of slides and a lot of that kind of like, you know, the missing spaces to create the groove. So I'm just gonna show you guys the bass line here and I'm gonna show you how I created the sound and uh, just show you guys the MIDI pattern so you can copy that if you do want. Okay, so let's add in a blank instance of Vital and I'm gonna copy this MIDI over to our new channel over here and I'm gonna show you guys how I created the sound. So I guess the major differences here uh, between your kind of like traditional Cytron space would be the fact that I kind of added some glide and I did a lot of like the similar sort of things that I would do in terms of like adding a filter and then adding some uh, envelope to the filter. But I guess the slight difference here is, you know, instead of just like a plucky envelope, I added a little bit of a tack to kind of simulate an almost electric bass kind of sound. So it's not like a electronic, like, you know, hard percussive knock sound. So here we're gonna wanna add some glide and some legato to allow that note to kind of like slide. Here what I wanna do is I wanna turn this phase randomization down because I kind of want a tighter sound. I want a kind of, you know, more the same sound every time that uh, note is re-triggered. And then here what I'm gonna do is let's just add in some low pass filter over here. So we can cut out some of those top harmonics which we don't really need uh, in the bass all that much. We want to kind of like sub a bass tone. <laughs> So here we actually wanna to jump to the main amplitude envelope and give this a little bit of attack as well, just to cut out some of that transient at the beginning of the sound. Cause like I said, we want more of a kind of like uh, electric bass sound with less transient and more of a kind of uh, body. And then to s accentuate that even more, what we can do is we can actually turn down the sustain a little bit and also turn down the decay a little bit just to give us uh, like more of a kind of body over here. And then it kind of like tapers off a little bit as the sound is kind of playing. Cool, so that sounds pretty good. The rest is down to effects processing. So here I added a little bit of compressor just to kind of like liven it up a little bit. So the compressor in Vital in multiband mode is synonymously noisy, but it's actually pretty cool to kind of like add a lively tone to something that you kind of want to sound a little bit more like a real instrument. 
And then I added a little bit of distortion as well. And then here I added some post filter on the distortion as well, just to cut out some of that kind of like clickiness that's coming through from the compressor. And here I actually put this same envelope onto the cutoff filter that's on the distortion over here. And then let's just mix it down a little bit. It's a bit loud. And then at the end of the train in Vital, I added a little bit of chorus. So here I just froze the frequency just so that it's a little bit less of a kind of wishy-washy sound. I turned down the mix over here and then just ramped up this cutoff and spread just to cut out the kind of like low frequencies that might be coming through from the sound here. Cool, so that's about it. The rest is down to EQ and fine tuning. So here I just EQ'd it a little bit I uh, boosted some of the lows and cut some of the tops. And then because we've got that kind of like pulsating kick drum, I added a little bit of LFO tool as well, just to kind of like side chain it off that kick rhythm. Uh, so here we just want to make sure that there's no like uh, immediate stops so that there are no clicks coming through. So because there's some chorus on the bass, I wanted to kind of like flatten the stereo image of it. Um, so I used the Kilohertz stereo and then just turned the width down to 0%. And I find that gave it a little bit more of a stable bass sound. Okay, so the next thing I want to show you is pretty simple, but I feel like it kind of plays quite a important role, like alongside the bass, it kind of has this nice groove and there's quite a lot of low frequencies in there. So I kind of either want to EQ them out or do some processing, but I feel like this part of the track also has a lot to do with the bass. So I'm going to go into this. And for this, I used a preset in the UVI World Suite called Ayasa and it's from the Handpan collection. So this is basically made up of two layers inside Falcon. I'm um, just playing like some simple uh, MIDI patterns. So I think this is actually detuned a little bit just because of um, if you guys have been following uh, my channel for a little, uh, little while, you know how I transpose things because I don't know all the keys and all that kind of thing. Um, so this channel is transposed minus five. So it's not playing exactly this MIDI, um, just so that you guys are getting an idea of exactly what's going on in terms of the music theory and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> You know, if you are coming here from Pete's channel or something like that, then your music theory knowledge is probably a little bit stronger than mine. So just please excuse me. This part consists of these kind of like two hand pan parts, one doing these kind of like chords and one doing this kind of like rhythmic thing. And I want to show you guys uh, the part and I want to render it out and we can kind of look into some processing. Okay, let's look at these, uh, this handpan chord sound. So I wanna process this with multi-pass and I wanna show you why for a really cool particular reason. So this sound actually has some really nice low end in it. Let's just uh, solo this and listen to the separate bands here. So like below 325 hertz or so, it's actually got some really nice kind of like harmonic 
low end. And I think we could kind of like mix this into the track to kind of create a little bit more of a kind of lively feel uh, in the low end. But I don't want it to kind of clash too much with the bass. But because we've kind of got this like rhythmic indifference in the bass, we've got these spaces where the bass isn't playing, I think we could kind of like have uh, use this uh, in a kind of like sidechain manner where we're sidechaining just the low end uh, of this hand pan. And multipass is actually the perfect thing to do this because we can actually set up a sidechain over here. Let's just enable it and go like this. And let's say uh, draw the sidechain input from our uh, new bass channel. And then over here, let's just add in a compressor and we can set this sidechain input to external. So now what's gonna happen is the threshold and ratio are gonna react to the sound of the bass rather than to the sound of the actual uh, lane inside multipass. So we can use this to duck out the low end of the hand pan every time the bass plays. And we could also do some interesting processing, like maybe let's apply some reverb to the top end and maybe a kind of like dub delay style delay uh, to the mid range of the sound. So one thing I do want to do is maybe remove some of this kind of like lower mid range from this hand pan. So we've kind of got the low tone coming through and the kind of sparkly top end because I want to leave some space for that guitar to kind of get mixed in here. And we can maybe duplicate this multi-pass channel onto this other hand pan, just so we've kind of got a similar kind of processing with the side chain. We might have to jump in here and set this up again uh, so that it's receiving side chain from the new base. Cool. And now we've side chained both of these hand pan channels to the low end. And I also want to show you guys a really cool thing. One of my favorite uh, new plugins, in fact. Uh, well, I'm not sure how new it is, but for creating ambiences and that kind of thing out of almost nothing or out of stuff that already exists, so you don't have to do much work to create it. It's a thing called Cloud Seed. So this is a reverb, uh, and uh, this pro uh, the preset that I usually use is Hyperplane. So you can send just a kind of pluck in here. So what I'm gonna do is just mute the rest of this and let's just send a single pluck in there and create a kind of like ambient bed for our track. So how I like to use this is to just pluck it once and record the output and then pluck it again. Say for example, if we've got these chord changes going on and then record each kind of chord as a separate kind of uh, sample and then layer them into the track as we need. So let's just jump in here and add an audio track. 
And then we can set the input of this audio track to cloud seed. And then we can just call this ambient. And then let's record in some of these hits. And then let's just cord, uh, cut out another one of these chords. I think it would be like this one would be the next sensible one in the progression. So now we can even go ahead and mute this hand pan channel. Let me actually just disable the reverb that's sending there. Um, we can actually mute this channel and create a kind of like ambient bed out of these reverb. Uh, it's it's the full wet signal that we've recorded out here. So we can kind of create our own custom ambient uh, using these. So let's just chop it to where these chords change and play around with the start positions of these samples. Cool, that's sounding great. I'm gonna hand over to Pete for the guitar parts for this track. And just one thing to bear in mind is the track was a little bit different when I sent it to him because obviously time and stuff. So yeah, the back track that you might be hearing in his segment of the video might be slightly different. And I did get a lot of inspiration in terms of the chord changes and that kind of thing from the parts that he had sent me. So anyway, handing over to him. Hope you enjoy his part of the video. See you guys soon. So Dash sent me over a couple of versions of the track to work with, and I chose a loop as it gave me more of a blank canvas to come up with ideas on top of. The loop itself, it's in G minor, and it's kind of based around this idea. Which is kind of G minor chord, and then suggesting E flat major going up to the flat nine. So this is very much a G Phrygian progression because uh, we've got G minor and then we've got the E flat in there and the A flat in there. So just talking about the theory of this for a second, G Phrygian is the third mode of E flat major. And it's basically, uh, if you take the notes of E flat major scale, but play them starting from G and playing them over a G chord, you would get G Phrygian. So the notes that make up G Phrygian are G, A flat, B flat, C, D, E flat, F, and back to G. Incidentally, I play with a band called Schwongel, and the first tune I ever played on with them is a track called Dorsal Perception, which I recently did a couple of videos looking at my guitar parts for that. And that also is entirely based in Phrygian. In that case, it's E Phrygian, but yeah, it's the sound world that I'm familiar with, I guess you could say. So for this, the initial idea I came up with, first thing sort of sprung out at me was, you know, texture. I thought it might sound nice with some nylon string arpeggio kind of ideas on this. I thought it'd be nice to add a bit of kind of harmonic color to it, a bit of kind of chord progression in there. And again, if we look at G Phrygian, we've got a few chords to play with if we want to add more to this. So if you harmonize the scale, which is basically building a chord off of each degree of the scale, you would get G minor, A flat major, B flat major, C minor, D diminished, E flat major, 
F minor, and back to G minor again. So any of those chords will work over this sort of sequence, you know, if you're looking for more ideas, for things to do with. So what I came up with was really based around moving between G minor and A flat major. Very Phrygian, very Phrygian sort of sound. And I came up with this little arpeggio part up here around an A-shaped G minor, G minor 7 chord. It's all based on the top three strings, but this is what I was, this is what I came up with, and talk a bit about it. So this sets so based around G minor seven, or you could also see it as a B flat triad, second inversion. Then I go up to the flat seventh, which is the F. Then switch up to an A shape, A flat chord. Then move to another inversion of A flat down here. Second inversion, A flat triad. Then kind of repeat the same idea we just had, but down a whole step, obviously staying with the harmony. So we take this A flat, then add what would now be the fifth, which is E flat. Then back up to the G minor seven, then skip down to the next inversion down, G minor. So second inversion, G minor triad. You get this nice looping figure. So the second idea I came up with was a complementary idea to this uh, arpeggio figure. So I was kind of thinking, you know, what might work with this? I thought maybe a lower part. And so I wanted to come up with something which would work in its own right. So depending on what Dash liked, what he wanted to use, he could just use that figure or he could use the two of them together. Or obviously he could completely abandon it and not use it at all. So I came up with the second figure, which kind of interlocks, is kind of harmonizes and is a little bit in counterpoint to the first figure. So again, it's based around these same sort of chords, G minor, G minor seven and A flat. And again, let me play it and then we'll talk a little bit about it. a little bit Cuban and a little bit sort of Montuno-esque, I guess. It's based around this G minor seven. Or you could see it as a B flat triad, root inversion. Then it skips down to an A flat triad, again, root triad. Then turns that into an A flat major seven. Or you could see that as C minor. See either way because I'm just playing the top three strings. Then goes back down to this B flat or G minor seven. Again, I like this figure as I say because it works quite nicely on its own, but also it's quite a nice interlocking part with the first one. It's not quite a harmonization of the first one, but it sort of weaves in and around it. So you get, you know, nice kind of similarities and then rhythmically it's a little bit different. And so, you know, you get different harmonies in different sort of places, but creates a nice sense of motion with the two of them together. So let's hear the two parts together. So having done the nylon string parts, I was thinking what else might work on this? 
I thought, you know, maybe something a bit more textural, some maybe sort of electric ideas might be good. So I think in this type of music, it's helpful if you can give people options, things to work with, because, you know, one idea can lead in all sorts of directions for other people that are sort of playing on there. So I thought I'll give some other ideas for Dash to play along with, you know, see what he likes. You know, he might abandon a lot of them or all of them for that matter. Don't know, but at least it will give him a few different directions which he can take with this. First thing I sort of came up with, which I quite liked, was a little kind of muted looping figure around G minor. So again, let me play it and we'll talk a little bit about it. So it's very much, it's double stops, it's kind of based around fourths. Let's say it's muted, and I decided to use the neck pickup, like a clean sound with the neck pickup. It's quite nice for that sort of slightly funky kind of muted kind of thing. So then I was thinking, what else can I come up with which would work in conjunction with that, but also work on its own, depending you know what Dash wants to do with it. And second idea I came up with was, again, this sort of, Nice kind of looping uh, figure and let me play it and we'll talk a bit about it. So this figure, I mean when I first came up with I actually played it like this. So it's kind of going down in thirds and straight down the scale from G to E flat. I changed the way I was fingering it just because I wanted to get it a bit smoother, a bit more kind of flowing into each other. So rather than get that. But one of the things I really liked about this was it's a rhythmic displacement idea. So it's got, it's made up of nine notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it repeats round and round. So it shifts rhythmically as you're playing it. Because it's starting in a different place every time because you're playing it as eighth notes. So you get this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry, I say it's eighth notes, actually sixteenth notes. So it kind of throws you off a little bit because it always seems like it's starting in a different place. So I thought that was an interesting sort of second figure. So then I was thinking, what else would work? We had something around here. We had something up here. So I was thinking maybe a lower part. Again, sonically, I wanted something which was kind of in a different sort of sound world. We had before, so I've switched to the bridge pickup and a kind of lightly distorted sound. So this will sit somewhere different sonically to what else we've got there. And for this, I thought a nice kind of low sort of rhythmic figure, you know, might work quite nicely. And again, something rhythmically which is in different places to what's already there. So this is the idea I came up with. <laughs> based around G minor, G minor triad, then up to A flat major. So it's just hinting at that A flat major chord. So I like this because rhythmically it was kind of again moving around a little bit. So the initial part of it starts on the beat, then the second part starts on the second sixteenth of the second beat and the third part of it starts on the fourth sixteenth of the third beat so 
So the actual rhythmic cells of it are the same each time, but it's just it's starting in a different place rhythmically, you know, which gives a lot more rhythmic interest to it. Okay, and then I thought there's room for one final part on this. So I wanted something which was higher still. So, you know, we've got different areas of the neck covered. We've got something around here, got something around here, got something around here. So I want to come up high to here. And you know, it's quite dense already. There's quite a lot going on. So I wanted something simple, something high, something simple sonically. I've switched to the middle pickup. I've kept this sort of slightly distorted sound. So again, you know, it's sort of sonically in a slightly different place. So, you know, finds its place in the mix that much easier. And part I came up with, it's really simple. It's just D and G right up here on the 15th fret. But rhythmically, I was looking for a space in the texture where this might fit. And the place I sort of found was like the final 16th of the fourth beat. So it's sort of anticipating the bar each time because there was just a nice little gap there where this could come in to get that nice sort of syncopated sort of feel to it. And also, yeah, it has its own place. So, I mean, this is what it sounds like. do uh, a little bit of sort of ghost strokes as well in there just to add a little bit of rhythmic impetus to get two, three, four, two, three, this sort of sound. So let's hear this in the context of the track as well and hear how that sort of fits with the other parts. Hopefully it does. Okay, so I sort of felt there was room for one last thing, which was kind of a solo. And I liked the nylon string pattern, the kind of interlocking pattern and the harmony there. I thought that would sound nice maybe with the guitar solo over the top. So initially I wondered about a nylon string solo on there, but then it felt like it got lost in the texture because there's already a couple of nylon strings there playing, you know, sort of quite fiddly parts. So I wanted something which sat in a slightly different place sonically. So I thought actually, you know, maybe an electric guitar thing over the top might sort of sit a little bit better in the mix. So I went for this Les Paul kind of sound. This is this lovely Eastman Les Paul I've been using quite a lot recently. I thought this sort of neck pickup, light sort of distortion sound, it seemed to sit really nicely against the nylon string texture underneath. So yeah, I thought let's put a solo on there. You know, Dash might like it, he might not feel it works, but again, it gives him the option for, you know, sort of further development for the track as it goes on. So, yeah, this is what I came up with.
Wow, thank you, Pete. That was amazing. Perfect. I think that's going to fit in here just right. So a couple of the parts stood out for me that I think are going to fit this part in particular that we're working on. And we may have to kind of change things up a little bit for like a verse and some other parts. Um, but I think this is going to be interesting to kind of have a look at how we might process and chop things to kind of fit in a little bit more. You know, just for this, this video, I'm going to keep things simple. I'm going to look at uh, two of these parts and how we can kind of uh, fit them into this groove. And then in further videos, we can look at developing the track uh, with kind of arrangement things and adding some uh, new leads and all sorts of things like that. So I did have a kind of potential lead that I was waiting to put into this track. But um, as you can see here, it's kind of like a simple arpeggiator type thing where these uh, the lowest kind of note in the arpeggiator changes alongside the key change um, in the track. But I feel like this is, it sounds a little bit too obvious. I don't know how to explain that. Um, the sound itself was actually taken from one of my preset banks. So this is the sound. It's The sound is called LD Monkey Puzzle. I believe it's from uh, Glitch Cytron's Essentials Volume 2, my vital uh, preset. But the MIDI for this, I feel like, like I said, it feels a little bit too obvious with the track. So I'm just going to play it for you guys and you can kind of give me a picture of, uh, you can let me know what you think. Um, but at the same time, what I want to do is I want to use one of these guitar parts that Pete had created and maybe try extract the MIDI from this to use as a kind of like running lead alongside the sound to kind of build that tension. Because I think this particular sound is very good at that. But yeah, this is the sound in question. So it's very nice for creating that kind of like tension, but I feel like the MIDI itself, like I said, is feeling a little bit too obvious. So this part here, Electric 2, that Peter created for us, this sounds really, really nice. Like I like the melody of this. And it's got this thing where I think all the notes are hitting at the exact spot that it, it, it doesn't feel too obvious with the key changes and it also fits in. But not only that is it does this really nice rhythmic thing because I think there's only nine notes in the progression as opposed to like eight or 16. So it kind of skips a note every so often and it does a really nice rhythmic thing. Cool. So just to make things quicker, what I'm going to do is just chop a small portion of this. I'm going to bounce it out and then we can look at how to extract the MIDI from an audio file. So if you double click it in Cubase, you've got this very audio tool over here. So essentially what this is, is it's kind of like an auto tune where it allows you to tune specific notes up and down, etc. But it's got a cool little thing here built in uh, under the functions where you can go extract MIDI. You get this little pop up, just notes, no pitch bend data. Indeed, we don't want any wonky pitch bend and it should extract us the MIDI onto a new channel. So here, what we can do is I don't want this to play through the Microsoft MIDI. Um, what we can do is we can just drag this over to our uh, synth channel over here. So I'm just going to put that aside. We might want to use that later. We're going to have to edit this a little bit to kind of like remove some of the, the kind of intricacies and that kind of thing. As you can see, it's not perfect. We will figure it out. What we'll do is we will do one part like this and then just loop it um, because I believe it's the same thing over and over again. So anyway. So first and foremost, we can go and we can quantize all of this MIDI and then we can figure out where the notes should be.
Awesome. That's about it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to be posting a couple of these presets, like the baseline preset, uh, to my Patreon for all my $5 supporters. And for those guitar people that might be watching this video, if you want the tabs and stuff for these things, uh, for these guitar parts that Pete created for us, then head over to his channel. He's got like a buy me a coffee kind of thing, which I guess is uh, similar to Patreon, where he's going to be uploading a bunch of the content there. Um, and also, if you want to support him, head on over to his channel and give him a subscribe. So... Yeah, like I said, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know what you think in the comments. As always, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. See you guys next time. Cheers.